it's a real pleasure to be here. And I know I stand between you and lunch, so I cut the equations, and this is just going to be some, some stories. My, my story starts when we were trying to help people who have difficulty understanding the emotions of others to be able to do that, especially to read facial expressions. Uh, here's a picture of a boy on the autism spectrum who is wearing a baseball cap with a small camera in it. Uh, since then, of course, those have been shrunk into Google Glass and other things we wear. And it's coupled to sophisticated machine learning software that can tell if the person that his camera is facing is looking at him with interest, with disagreement, with confusion, with engagement, and other facial expressions that are super important to understand, in particular pleasure and displeasure, if you're trying to find out what your boss thinks of what you just presented. Now we've learned not just people on the autism spectrum and people with nonverbal learning disabilities, but lots of people, especially in the technology world, have difficulty reading facial expressions. Uh, and maybe not quite as common at Wharton, uh, but I have seen this problem in the business world quite a bit. You may have also. In the beginning, we had hundreds of examples of data. We could train up the machine learning good enough to get papers published, uh, but that wasn't really good enough to deploy and uh, avoid embarrassing errors in real life. So Rana El Kalyubi and I co-founded Affectiva, who has commercialized this and improved on this software. And here's an example of just one picture of work from Dan McDuff, who uh, the vertical axis is showing increasing um, accuracy using a particular machine learning measure area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. And this is 100 positive training examples, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And what we see is that as we go up by orders of magnitude in data, we are able to climb from kind of the publishable range in the upper 70s to the 90s. And today, this software is able to be more than 90% accurate on more than 24 different facial expressions. Uh, it's in use right now by a third of, <clears throat> a third of the um, Fortune Global 100 companies. And you can actually download for free uh, a demo version of this app to play with. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and it doesn't collect private data about you or anything. It's just interactive. Uh, and you can get it by just searching for AFTEX.me on uh, either Android or iOS devices. This capability now is now available with high accuracy in an SDK that allows people to integrate it not only into feedback on advertising before you drop millions of dollars on that campaign. <clears throat> you want to see if maybe the teens are really smiling and laughing at it and the parents are looking horrified. Uh, or if those smirks, we, we saw a lot of people who said they liked things, but the reality is they were smirking and they really were just trying to be polite. Now, one of the things I love about people on the autism spectrum is their honesty. And one of them said to me one day, Roz, you've got it all wrong. My biggest problem is not recognizing other people's emotions. My biggest problem is you're not recognizing my emotions. And at first, I, I felt pretty hurt. <laughs> I work on this stuff. And she goes, no, it's not just you. Uh, it's everybody. Everybody is not recognizing my emotions properly. And I said, what are we not recognizing? And she said, we're experiencing enormous stress and anxiety, and you're not seeing it. And I realized, as I looked at examples of uh, lots of other cases, we, we think when somebody looks stressed, they look, look like this little boy. But I was seeing lots of examples as we started to measure the unobservables inside, back to the theme earlier this morning, um, with observable data, that people could look very calm or detached or you know, kind of chill on the outside, while on the inside they're about to erupt, they're about to explode. And this is what gets a lot of kids, unfortunately, kicked out of school when they look pretty chill, Johnny's laying on the floor, teacher's like, hey man, get off the floor, get back to work, and he gets up and he pops her one, right? Gets kicked out of school. Now, in the workplace, we see slightly more refined versions of that, but I'll say it still happens, right? So how could we measure that internal stress state as it builds? Well, we knew from our early work on affect, we thought there was this general thing that changed in emotion called arousal, autonomic arousal. It goes up as you're getting more and more activated. And it used to be measured with uh, something called galvanic skin response. We use electrodermal activity, more scientific version of this. And at the Media Lab, we built new ways to get this uh, where you didn't have to tether wires to the fingers. The simplistic notion is that as you get stressed, your palms get sweaty. 
Uh, but it turns out to be a lot more interesting than that. And here are two devices I'm, I'm wearing today, the um, E4 that has been collecting data for a couple years uh, for researchers by Empatica and also collects heart rate information using a dual LED PPG photoplethysmograph. Uh, so it's better, it's actually a certified medical device in Europe. And this one, that's a certified medical device in Europe too right now, uh, the Embrace. Here's an example of what these data look like from one of our earliest prototypes. This was a child who was streaming the data wirelessly off of her left and right ankles. Uh, you can't see the sensors on her ankles here, but you can see at the bottom, this is 45 minutes of occupational therapy data. Uh, it was going up earlier when she had a meltdown. It was going up earlier when she became very activated uh, with something she was frustrated about. And here it's going up as she's climbing on the swing. This illustrates some ambiguity in the signal. It can go up with physical exertion. It can go up with cognitive load. If for somebody motor planning to move their limbs is hard, it can go up just thinking about how to move your limbs. And it can go up with emotional load and excitement. Uh, and here we saw this big peak as she got on. And then uh, maybe more importantly for good customer experiences is what makes it go down? What puts your customer at ease? What puts that person you're building a relationship with at ease? What makes that nice decaying exponential? For a lot of people, it's a repetitive movement, but it can be lots of different things. Uh, I, some people on the autism spectrum pointed out to me Bill Gates before some of the antitrust hearings under enormous stress, and he was sitting there rocking, <laughs> right? Something that can lower the signal. Here's the first time I saw this electrodermal activity signal um, measured as skin conductance on the wrist, uh, in this case for an MIT student. Here's seven days of data, 24 hours. We see it going up with lab activity, down with television, uh, big with exams and studying at MIT, uh, as you would expect with cognitive and, and affective, hopeful, hopefully interest engagement in the task. Huge with lab, huge with this MIT problem set here. Uh, and to the embarrassment of we MIT professors, the low point pretty much every day, uh, <laughs> classroom activity. I don't have time in this talk to tell you about sleep, but sleep is extremely interesting and important. And to our total surprise, the biggest peaks of the day are usually during sleep. This should bug you because I've just said this is activation, right? Sleep, we think, should look a little more like classroom activity. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, if you're interested in this, catch me during lunch. I'll tell you a lot more. I'll put up paper links at the end, too, where you can get more. Now, once we built a sensor that could leave the lab, we uh, we started getting a lot of requests for it. And one day, an undergrad came and knocked on my door and he said, Professor Picard, could I borrow one of your sensors, please? My, my little brother has autism and he can't talk and I wanna see what's stressing him out. And I said, sure, in fact, take two. And so he takes the sensors home, he puts them on his left and right wrist of his little brother. I thought he'd use one and then the second one when the first one broke, but no, he's got them on redundantly. Should be the same thing on both sides, I thought. Well, I'm back at my lab looking at the boys' data, and the first day's data looks super chill. Next day, pretty chill. Next day, you're on, I'm like, hey, this boy looks calmer than anybody I've ever seen. Next day, my jaw drops. One of the sensor's data had gone so high that I thought the sensor must be broken. We have stressed people out at MIT in pretty much every way imaginable. <laughs> I've never seen it go so high. And the other side was not responding, so I thought it must be broken too. I mean, really, like how can you be stressed on one side of your body? Uh, I tried lots of things to debug this. I finally gave up and I called the student at home. Hey, do you have any idea what happened to your little brother at this date and time? Uh, and he says, I don't know, I'll check the diary. Diary? He keeps a diary? And I'm waiting and he comes back and he tells me the exact date and time and he says, that's right before he had a grand mal seizure. Now, I didn't know anything about seizures. I certainly wasn't looking for seizures in the data. I was looking for stress. And as I learned a little bit more about them, I became interested and I called uh, Dr. Madsen at Children's Hospital Boston. Dr. Madsen, is it possible somebody could have a huge sympathetic nervous system, this is the fight or flight response, uh, surge, on, I didn't want to say on one side of the body, um, you know, but before a seizure. And he says, probably not. Uh, but he says, it's interesting. We've seen people whose hair stands on in on one arm uh, before a seizure. On one arm? And I explained to him how it was on just one side. Well, he got very interested. 
We made a bunch more sensors, got them safe, safety certified, enrolled them. Um, he had 90 children coming in for a study for brain surgery. They were all not responding to drugs for their seizures. Put the sensors on with gold standard video EEG, ECG, and now EDA, electrodermal activity, on the wrists. And we learned that 100% of the convulsive seizures had a significant skin conductance response on the wrist. Uh, not usually 20 minutes before the seizure, not usually in advance of the seizure at all, and not usually on just one side, but usually on both sides, and usually at the exact time the electrical activation started in the brain. We also learned, to our surprise, that um, combining this information with the movement and with machine learning, we could build an automated detector that uh, at the very beginning was 94% accurate, and since then, Empatica has improved it significantly. Uh, with that, we also learned, as we were trying to understand why these data were so big with skin conductance, um, we learned that there's a tragic thing called SUDEP. And I bet, I'd be curious, has anybody here heard of SUDEP before? Uh, I see only like three hands. All right, now you've all heard of SUDEP. What is it? Sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. One in 26 people has epilepsy in America at some point in their life. You probably have friends who have it and they haven't told you. You should ask them. Uh, they probably also haven't heard of SUDEP. It, only in the last several years have doctors started to really get ragged on for not telling their patients about this. It's the number two cause of years of potential life loss after stroke. Now, we learned that the size of that response we're getting on the wrist relates to something that happens and has been observed in all the SUDEPs. During the seizure, th these are all EEG traces, little electrodes on your scalp. The brain activity is kind of going crazy, then it stops, then it goes flat. Um, usually it goes back to normal brain activity, but before SUDEPs, it goes flat. Um, fortunately, it sometimes comes back and goes back to normal activity, and it did in our data. Um, but in some cases, um, it goes flat for a long period of time. And it turns out that the longer it goes flat, the bigger the signal we get here. Now, how weird is this? Looks like you have no brain activity, EEG is saying nothing's going on in there, um, but we're getting this huge response that we think is generated by these emotion centers of the brain that might be being kind of attacked by this unusual electrical activity. Um, by the way, this is published in neurology, it's been replicated. Uh, yes, it sounds weird and freaky that something going on deep in your brain can show up on the wrist and not on the scalp, uh, but we've learned that EEG sits on the scalp and it misses a lot of stuff deeper in the brain. A lot of the emotion phenomena we want, you cannot get with an EEG. You have to go deeper, and the EEG doesn't go there. But the skin through the ectoderm is connected uh, to this neural tissue. Um, because we also learned that SUDEP, if, that, that SUDEP is less likely to happen if somebody gets there and stimulates the person and can restart their breathing, we learned that we need to take a little detour from our affect work for a moment and try to get an alert built. So we took the sensor and we um, did a lot of testing and built a new version that didn't just collect data like this one, but that now can run the machine learning on board in real time, detect patterns of interest, such as a convulsive seizure event, and send an alert to the smartphone, which then can go to your network and have people come and check on you. Uh, and with uh, Embrace today, people are using it right now in clinical trials in the US for this and in Europe uh, for seizure detection. It also comes with analytics for sleep, love to tell you more about that, for activity, um, steps, low, medium, high activity. For, um, actually it doesn't yet come with analytics for pain and mood. These are active research projects that we're working on at MIT. Very proud, my students at MIT now coupling um, sensor data with smartphone data with input that we give our phones behaviorally, our social networks and lots of other stuff going on, our sleep patterns. We are now able to predict your mood tomorrow night based on a set of your data through today uh, with 82 to 87% accuracy um, using some very advanced machine learning. We're also uh, soon, I've been testing software that will soon be released to show people their stress and calm, which is something we've been trying to do for a very long time to get to market, uh, but got held up for the um, seizure work, and continuing to work on engagement, very important in marketing. Uh, but the thing that's engaged me most that I'm excited to share with you recently was just this last example. I got an email from a mom the other morning. She said she was in the shower. Her phone went off saying um, her daughter needed help. She goes running out of the shower to check on her, finds her face down in bed, blue, not breathing. Flipping her over, simply being there when somebody has a seizure that cuts off their breathing and stimulating them can sometimes restart their breathing. In this case, she flips her over, she starts breathing again. 
she turns pink, um, and uh, she was fine all day, and she sends me this email a half hour later, and I'm freaking out, going, no, don't rely on this, what, you know, the battery might not work, the Bluetooth might not work. Um, <laughs> and she's like, it's okay, I understand technology has its limits. Um, it got us there in time, and she sent pictures all day of her swinging and doing all kinds of other wonderful things. So my final message for you, as you do your analytics, a lot of you are trained as psychologists. You're told only to hypothesize something and only to measure that thing. Um, don't stop there. When your data's weird, when there's strange stuff in it, make time to dig a little further. Don't just look, in my case, I was just looking for stress and anxiety, but look at the weird stuff. Go into fields and to experts that you don't know anything about and be bold in asking them questions. And as you do that, you may not only have some fascinating um, adventures, um, but you also may just be able to really help some people um, improve their lives or possibly even save a life. Thank you very much.